In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My brothers and my sisters, I greet you on this landmark day of our 27th annual conference. And although we are not able to be with each other, bodily we can and should take this time as an opportunity to look with a new set of eyes, to seek the Lord's face in this midst of such uncertainties. And with this hope in mind, I would like to begin my talk with a question a question that I pray will help to address the theme of our conference. What color are your eyes? What color are the eyes of your spouse or your child? Obviously, the answer to this question is going to be incredibly diverse according to how many people were to answer the question. And yet, an interesting phenomena is demonstrated here. In answering this question, some would say, I have blue eyes, and some would say, I have brown, and yet, in the midst of all these answers, which individually, of course, would be correct, everyone could answer the question by saying either my eyes are black or they could say my eyes are white. You see, the human eye, or at least the visible part that we identify as the eye, is comprised of three portions, the sclera, which is the surrounding white portion of the eye, the iris, which is the colored portion of the eye, which incidentally will also be the portion that most will refer to when seeking to answer the question. And finally, the pupil, which is black and, and is also the smallest part of the three. It would also be safe to say that the vast majority of people who answer this question answer by naming the iris. And yet we all share complete unity in the exactness of the pupil and the sclera. Why then do we default to the iris? If unity and inclusion is what our society is striving for, why then do we default to that which is seemingly setting us, setting us apart from one another? On April 5th, 1968, which was the day after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, Jane Elliott taught her brown eye, blue eyed exercise. The exercise eventually divided up the classroom into blue or brown eyes and then gave the brown eyed students greater advantage over, and privilege. She observed the brown eyed kids who had been given greater privileges and began to treat the blue eyed children poorly. She then reversed the experiment the next day and naturally the blue eyed children began to follow suit and treating their fellow students poorly. It was with this exercise that Miss Elliot offered a great contribution to the work of dismantling the falsehood of racism. However, as with any good moral or spiritual work, we must be doers of the word and simply not hearers. My brothers and sisters, we are now halfway through 2020 and the whole world has forever changed in a matter of six months. And yet some of these changes are seemingly particular to our country. In regard to the unrest we are witnessing around issues of justice and race, I doubt anyone would disagree that they have been fomenting for years. Moreover, I don't think it would be far-fetched to point to 2017 as a shift in the attitude and fervor in which these issues are engaged in our country and perhaps even around the world. In other words, much of the tone of the racial strife we see in 2020 found its flavor in 2017 when ideas of neo-segregation and white nationalism leaped from obscure internet chat rooms and into the national spotlight. In 2017, in the aftermath of Charlottesville, the title for my talk at the 24th Annual Conference was Saul's Armor Doesn't Fit. And in it, I spoke on the phenomena of voices within the church offering political commentary on those terrible events and the obvious fact that many of these same voices were often out of their depth. That the trend of Orthodox Christians and especially clergy to take to the internet and battle these issues out with all the bluster of a late night news pundit, but with none of the blessing of a transcendent God who rules both heaven and earth. I argued that we were seemingly blind to the obvious co-opting and burgeoning infiltration of our holy church by white supremacists and racial separatists. And now in 2020, I see that phenomena and danger is still ever present. However, it's morphed and multiplied now it simply isn't the reality of white separatists and supremacists infiltrating and dividing. It's now those who would do the same with the name of racial equality and the black struggle. And yet Saul's armor still 
doesn't fit. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, St. Paul speaks to a body that is suffering from division. He writes, Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink, even so the body is not made up of one part, but many. He goes on to say, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unrepresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each of you is a part of it. St. Paul's vision of unity is striking. Not so much that it calls for a greater awareness of the other from individuals, but because it calls for those who would be seemingly at odds and irreconcilable to be aware of each other as a single body. We must ask ourselves, could there be any other way for the apostle to see? Is this not the prayer and vision that our Lord offered to the Father? In the Gospel of John, our Lord prayed, I do not pray for those alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you have given me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. St. Paul caught that vision because he moved outside of himself outside of his perceived identity for the sake of his true identity, which is in Christ. In his epistle to the Galatians, he writes, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that which preached by me is not man's gospel, for I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God violently and tried to destroy it, and I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. But when he would have set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. For St. Paul, his identity was found to be only in Christ. And more importantly, it was actually in his abandoning of his earthly identity as both a learned rabbi and a Jew of the most greatest stock that he would be able to be all the more and to see and obtain his true heavenly identity, which is found only in Christ. Again, the Apostle Paul, this time in the epistle to the Philippians, states, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. In truth, we can see not only from these selected scriptures, but from the lasting fruit of St. Paul's work in sowing spiritual seed where none had been sown before. And by calling to unity those who were at enmity with both themselves and God, and more importantly, by first abandoning his own inheritance of identity. He leads by example and without hypocrisy. This vision of being able to truly see, to have sight beyond sight, to see the other as yourself is only possible 
if the one who is looking looks without distraction of self. My brothers and sisters, it is impossible for your physical eyes to be aware of themselves in the same capacity in which they are aware of what and who they are looking upon. Your physical eyes do not see themselves. They only see the other. The pupil simply receives the light as it may. And if you will allow me the turn of phrase, the pupil only, treat, only truly teaches what he is taught. I would like to now turn our attention as pupils to our common teacher in the faith, St. Moses. In his teachings and in his life, we see some hard things, but do we have the vision to truly see what is being laid before us? Or do we simply take our Holy Father at face value for the color of his skin or for the fallenness of his former life and how it seemingly resonates? For many who are new to the work and community of the fellowship, I would ask you, have you studied and not simply read the life of our Holy Father? Or has your awareness of his life been simply from a digital snippets and social media posts? I ask this because like our master, there are things that are hard to understand in his life. And I submit to you that it is precisely the hard things that are the most needed. For example, it is said of our Holy Father in the faith, St. Moses, that one day when a council was being held in Sketis, the fathers treated Moses with contempt in order to test him, saying, why does this black man come among us? When he heard this, he kept silence. And when the council was dismissed, they said to him, Abba, did that not grieve you at all? And he said to them, I was grieved, but I kept silence. My brothers and sisters, when you hear this hard saying, how does it make you feel? Does it leave you confused? Does it leave you questioning the faith or our tradition? Does it begin to give weight to the contemporary critiques against Christianity that are so prevalent in the current zeitgeist? I know that for many years it left me confused. And yet, in my willingness to learn from our beloved patron, I find myself closer to understanding I find that truly St. Moses is a worthy patron for all Orthodox, for all who seek refuge in this bitter world, but especially for African Americans. For it is not the sanctity and the transformative power of a life dignified by Christ, like endurance, that finally broke the stranglehold of Jim Crow and of segregation. How providential that such a holy man from the 5th century deserts of Africa would experience what so many in the 21st century deserts of the inner city would experience. But are we learning from him, our Holy Father in the faith? Are we, as the pupils, teaching what has been taught? Allow me to put it another way. What is our vision, not just as a fellowship, but as the church? Do we seek to throw our interpretation of orthodoxy into the marketplace of ideas, seeking to compete with all the other peddlers of worldly authority and accolades? Are we watering down the good wine we've been given, or are we turning the stagnant and bitter water of our lives into new wine? In my short time working with nonprofit organizations, I learned that duplication of services is not best practice. And I would submit that we as the body of Christ, and more specifically as a fellowship, would be wise to heed that practice. That we do not seek to offer what the world has to offer, but instead that we offer the one thing that no one else can. The search for racial identity is a seemingly natural pursuit for a people who have in many ways lost their identity. But what if that identity wasn't actually lost? What if it was actually being formed and lived out as we speak? What if, like the pupil or the iris, that identity was to be actively experienced and not observed as if it was some sort of trophy or goal to be gained? The domination of identity politics, and particularly for African Americans in this country, has in fact left the very community that it's supposedly meant to serve blinded and groping in the ever darkening landscape of the Western world. As our Lord had said, that those who seek to find their life must lose it, and that those who lose their life for his sake will find it. No words could better address the seemingly inescapable trap that African Americans have found ourselves in but I believe that we can escape this trap, but only with God's holy help. Money won't fix it. Millions are poured into social programs and yet African Americans still struggle. Political power and policies won't fix it either. 
In a recent op-ed, Walter E. Williams, a professor of economics at George Mason University, addressed this reality of the false black power of political gains. He writes, in 1965, there were no blacks in the U.S. Senate, nor were there any black governors, and only six members of the House of Representatives were black. As of 2019, there was far greater representation in some areas. 52 members of the House are black. Black Americans have served in Senate, including Edward W. Brook of Massachusetts, Carol Mosley Braun, and of course, Barack Obama of Illinois, Tim Scott of South Carolina, Cory Booker of New Jersey, and Kamala Harris of California. In recent times, there have been three black state governors. The bottom line is that today's black Americans have significant political power at all levels of government. Yet, what has this meant for a large segment of the black population? My brothers and sisters, I would submit to you that these political gains are the only fruit of identity politics, but it is a fruit that is rotting on the vine and on the ground. If we were to measure what African Americans are wanting and needing, it seems that your only course of action would to be look at the conglomerate of corporate and political pundits sponsoring organizations like BLM. And if it was one to go to strictly to that, you would have to come to the conclusion that African Americans are a helpless and pathetic lot that we have scraped and stumbled since we came out of the mire of slavery, and that in fact, we won't be actually whole and healed as a people until we get what's ours. But what is it that we are supposedly looking for? What is this continuously elusive prize that we simply cannot attain for ourselves, that only by demanding a forced apology and begrudgingly given reparations from those who we are told victimized us can we truly be dignified and whole? I believe that what the world and the devil has duped both African Americans and those who would be our allies into continuously questioning what that prize is and that it is something that we don't already have. My brothers and sisters, I submit to you that we are in fact already own this elusive prize. Moreover, I would submit that the prize has not only failed in satisfying us as a people and has in reality poisoned us. That prize is power worldly power to be more exact. And like all who seek power, once a taste has been given, it is never enough. It can never satisfy. I imagine many of you who are hearing this might be shaking your heads and wondering what in the world I'm talking about. How can I say that African Americans have power? Then I will ask you this question. Who dominates the pop charts? What community has successfully shaped the artistic and creative landscape for the last 100 years in America, from jazz to hip hop? Whose buying power was 1.4 trillion in 2019, which happens to be more than the GDP of Mexico? I've already mentioned the various political seats held by African Americans, and still, will you say we have no power? Yes, we have power. And I said earlier, it's obviously not satisfying. We still thirst as a people, but our Lord said that he has water, that if we were to drink of it, we would never thirst again. Holy Orthodoxy being the fullness of the faith, or if you will, the depth of that sweet well that is Christ. It is our faith tradition alone that offers what is necessary to quench the, the thirst of African Americans. For in this well, both nation and individual find the drinking gourd by which the depth of the water can be drawn with. In the fifth century on love, St. Maximus the Confessor writes, spiritual knowledge unites knower and known, while ignorance is always a cause of change and self-division in the ignorant. Hence, nothing according to sacred scripture will shift him who truly believes from the ground of his true faith in which resides the permanence of his immutable and unchanging identity. For he who has been united with the truth has the assurance that all is well with him even though most people rebuke him for being out of his mind, but without being aware that he has moved from illusion to the truth of real faith, and he knows for sure that he is not deranged. He has been liberated from the fluctuating and fickle turmoil of the manifold forms of illusion. This fickle and fluctuating turmoil is temporal identity, ego, self, power, it is an illusion, and yet we are still grasping for it. There are many things that can be said, but what can be done? My brothers and sisters, we must cast a vision for the people, 
a vision that is heavenly, indestructible, and beautiful. We must give people orthodoxy, but in order to do that, our vision must be clear. We must see our tradition for what it is, the ark by which beasts are turned into men, the place where beauty is given for ashes, and by which the broken are healed and the captives are liberated. But in order for us to accomplish this, we must see the truth of where people are actually broken, the truth of where people are actually in need of healing, and the truth of where people are actually held captive. Plato wrote, self-knowledge can be obtained only by looking into the mind and virtue of the soul, which is the diviner part of man, as we see our own image in another's eye. Orthodoxy gives the means by which purification, illumination, and deification are possible. And this is only possible by becoming and knowing that the search for true identity is only salvific, life-giving, and possible in the body of Christ. This is the lesson given by our Holy Fathers. But will the pupils teach what's been taught? Will we see the unifying principle and hold this out as the way forward? Will we learn and teach that in every icon of Christ, the pupil is black and the sclera is white? In closing, I would like to ask one more question. If you were to lose your sight, if you were to close your eyes, what would you miss the most? Again, like the first question, the answers will be infinitely varied, but I would say to you that all the answers could be boiled down to one word, beauty. This is what you would miss. This is the ultimate purpose and function of the eye, to behold beauty. Identity politics have blinded too many. It has left too many groping in the dark for something that is best left alone. And more tragically, it has blinded too many from what is desperately needed. Holy orthodoxy is the pursuit of true beauty, of holy wisdom, the pursuit of God. And this is what all people are looking for. And we as the church alone can give it to them. This reason alone is why we exist. Let us now be faithful in fulfilling this command. Let us love.